When I work with pipelines, what you might call CI or CI-CD, I have special requirements that might not be the same as what others might have, or more likely, what others think of. I need to be able to execute a set of tasks every time I push changes to a Git repo. That's hopefully everyone's requirement. So there is nothing new there. I also need to be able to run tasks both locally, while developing, and remotely, triggered by an event like a push to a Git repo. That's a tough one, since most, if not all, pipeline solutions work only and exclusively remotely. I tend to solve that issue by using a tool that is independent of pipelines and then simply invoke that tool from my laptop or from pipelines. That's why I advocate for Dagger, which I explored in that video. Finally, I prefer using containers as an easy way to get all the tools needed for each of the steps or tasks of a pipeline. That's also one of the things that makes Dagger special. It allows us to work with containers easily and in a similar way we would work with them in remote pipelines. Nevertheless, while some of you liked the idea of writing pipelines in a programming language of choice, many of you complained. Quite a few of you prefer a declarative format for defining pipelines. This video is my way of saying I hear you. I will find something else. So what can we use to define all the tasks we should run that would work well with containers, that would work both locally and remotely, and that would be using a declarative format to define all the steps? My first reaction was to use Makefile. It's been around forever and many people know it. I could define all my tasks in Makefile and just run them from my laptop or from inside pipelines like uh, GitHub Actions or Jenkins or Tekton or whatever I'm using. Now, unlike Dagger, Makefile does not provide any help when working with containers. Sure, I can execute docker this and docker that commands, but that's cumbersome when we need to move files from one to another, share the state, and do whatever else we are used to do in pipelines. That's, however, not the problem, since I'm moving away from containers when executing tasks locally, at least. If you watched that video, you know that I'm going back to Nix. It's awesome, and I don't need containers to manage tooling I need. I'm not dropping containers, just to be clear. All my apps are running and will continue running as containers, at least until Wasm becomes a thing, if ever. What I'm saying is that I don't need containers to run specific tasks that require specific tools. I believe that Nix is a better option. So, lack of meaningful support for containers in Makefile is not an issue. Nevertheless, I do not like Makefile. It's there, I use it, but I don't like it. There are quite a few other issues, often not big ones, that made me look for something else. I will not waste your time with long rambling about all the things I dislike, so here's a short version. Using tabs for indentation should be legal, yet it is mandatory in Makefile. It's often hard to read it and deduce what it's supposed to do, making it uh, list targets and their descriptions is close to impossible. I mean, it's possible, but painful. It first tries to read files instead of executing commands, resulting in some silly situations. There are quite a few other annoyances with Makefile, and as I already mentioned, I will not go into all of them nor explain in more depth why I don't like Makefile. The point is that I want Makefile-like solution that is simple, that can do what I need it to do, that I can execute both locally and inside remote pipelines, and I don't care much about any special features related to containers. The moment I crystallized those requirements in my head, the solution self-revealed itself. There is a tool that is very similar to make and make file, yet one that does not make me miserable. And that tool is task. Task is, as you can guess from the name, a tool that helps us run tasks, like those related to testing, building, packaging, deploying, or whichever other tasks you might be executing, especially while developing. It's simple, it's easy to write and read, and since it is a single command, it can run on your laptop, in a remote pipeline, or anywhere else. It's awesome for those that do want to be able to run tasks anywhere and not only as remote pipelines. It's great for those who use but do not like make and make file. 
It is for those that do not want to use a programming language like Go or Python or whatever you're used to. Let's take a look at the task file I am using in one of my projects. That's probably too much to digest in one go, so I will go back to snippets from that file as we progress. To begin with, we can easily discover what are available tasks. Having a clear and easy to access list of all the tasks we can execute is a crucial part of the user experience. I might not need it since I wrote that task file, but anyone else using it will appreciate it. That output is pretty similar to what we would expect from a good CLI. From there on, we can choose which task to execute. We can also get a summary of a specific task. Besides the description, we can see which commands will be executed if we run it. In this case, I'm executing Timoni to generate YAML manifests and removing the last line of the output. The details of what I'm doing in this task or any other are not important, especially since this project might be doing stuff that you will likely not need. What matters is that I'm using task file to define all the tasks, all the tasks I need to execute, and that so far it's been very, very helpful telling me what I can do with each of them. Let's look at the definition of that task. As you can see, it's a simple list of commands which we can execute with task package generate. That's it. Discover all the available tasks and execute whichever task you would like to run. It should be simple, and it is. The best part is that as long as you know what to execute, there is almost nothing to learn, at least not for such a simple scenario. But there's more. Much, much more. Let's take a look at a slightly more complicated example. That task adds a few additional features beyond the simple list of commands that should be executed. To begin with, we can define variables like, in this case, timeout and providers. While the timeout variable is straightforward with a hard-coded value, providers will execute a shell command and convert the output into the value of that variable. In this case, I'm retrieving a list of all files in a directory with ls, and then excluding those that contain config with uh, grep. Task does not care what those commands are. All it cares is that the output, in this case the list of files, will be stored in a variable. Then we have dependencies. Those are other tasks that will be executed before this one. That removes duplication. In this case, I need to generate a package both during execution of a cluster create task, but also as a separate task or a part of some other task. That's the task we saw and executed earlier. Dependencies are executed in parallel to speed up execution. It's almost always better to be fast. No one likes waiting for results. However, it is very important to keep that in mind when writing task file. I got burned more than once by adding tasks to dependencies and forgetting that they run in parallel. As a result, I spent hours trying to figure out why the results are not as expected. So, when you're thinking whether to put the task as a dependency or into the list of commands, the question you should be asking is whether it can run in parallel with others. If it can't, it is not a dependency. Anyways, once all the dependent tasks are executed, it will execute the commands of this task. Some of them, like Helm Upgrade, are straightforward commands, while others are a bit more complicated. For example, I had to execute kubectl apply for each file in a directory except if that file contains config in the name. That's the list of files are stored as the value of the provider's variable. So one of the commands will iterate over each value, each file in this case, in the provider's variable and execute kubectl apply. There is also a possibility to execute another task, not as dependencies, but as one of the task commands. Now, as a user who just wants to understand what that task does without trying to figure out what the author wanted to accomplish, I can simply execute it in the dry run mode. The output is not a simple list of all the dependencies and commands specified in that task. It is truly a dry run. It converted all that logic into the actual commands without running them. So, for example, uh, the kubectl apply command that should be executed for each file in a directory results in nine distinct commands. And that two commands coming afterwards are inherited from the package apply task. Now that I saw what would happen if I would run the cluster create task, I can just run it. There's more much more than we can cover in this video. So let me show you only one more feature. It's something I cannot live without, yet something that does not work as well as I hoped it would work. That feature is the watcher. In this case, I instructed it to watch 
for changes in files inside sources and generates fields. Those should be self-explanatory, right? Sources is the location of the source code it watches, and generates is the list of files generated from the source code. So the test watch task monitors my source code, and whenever it changes, it will execute the dependencies and commands. Let's see it in action. After a while, it executed all the commands specified in that task, and now it is waiting patiently for me to change the source code. So let me, for example, modify one of the tests and it detected the change and started executing all the commands again. As a result, I tend to keep it running in one window while I write code in another. I don't have to run commands every time I want to perform some actions like testing, but just glimpse at the result and depending on the outcome, either continue writing code or fix the issue I just caused. If you write tests first, you get test-driven development. Let's do another change by, for example, undoing the previous one, and there we go. It run again. Once it is finished working, all I have to do is press Control C to stop the watcher and execute the cluster destroy task that will destroy everything and leave my machine in the state it was before I started. There are many other features task offers, which I won't explore today. Instead, I want to talk about pros and cons of using it, but, but before I do that, let me show you how the pipeline of that project uh, looks like. This is GitHub Actions pipeline, and the logic would be the same no matter what uh, your choice is. If you ignore code checkout and the setup steps that are installing all the tools that pipeline needs, all the other commands ahead in that pipeline are now replaced with simple task test and task package publish commands, of course. Actually, there is the part that commits and pushes changes back to the repo. Since I have no plans to run those commands from task, I love them as is. As a result, all the tasks that I might run locally or remotely are defined in one place, in task file, and the pipeline just executes it. There is no duplication, and excluding the parts that are executed only from the pipeline, everything works everywhere. I do have one pending task, though. I'm planning to replace those setup steps with Nix so that all the tools are also managed in one place, in shell.nix. Uh, but I was too lazy to do it, so it's in my to-do list. I'll do it, I promise, one day. Finally, there is also a VS Code extension, which I haven't tried, so I can't comment on it. I don't use it. I prefer terminals for everything, 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 but writing code and observability. I could not find a single thing I don't like, assuming that I prefer a declarative way to define tasks. Actually, actually, now that I think about it, there is one thing that annoys me with the task file. Annoys the hell out of me. Watcher is silly. It will execute the dependencies and the tasks every time we change the source code. That might sound like the expected behavior at first, but it's not. That might result in a new iteration being executed before the previous one ends, completely, completely messing up with whatever you're doing, or I doing, or whomever is doing. That can be somewhat mitigated by changing the default watch interval from the default value of five seconds to whatever you expect it to be the duration of the task execution, and then multiplied by two for good taste. Still, that's only a workaround, and I think that the correct behavior should be for the watcher to wait until the execution of the current iteration is finished before starting a new one. I had to develop muscle memory to never save the file I'm working on if less than 10 seconds passed since the last time I saved. It's not the end of the world type of an issue, but it is an annoying issue nevertheless. As a matter of fact, it could be the only, the only negative thing to say about task. So let's move into cons. The first negative thing I might say is that task was not designed to work with containers, like for example, Dagger is. You can certainly run it inside containers and you can certainly use it to execute docker this and docker that commands. However, it does not have anything baked in. Now, for me, that is not a real negative thing, real con for two reasons, two. When executing it locally, I switch to Nix, so I don't need containers to run tasks. As a matter of fact, I stopped using containers when running development tasks. Second, 
When tasks run remotely, pipelines already support containers and we normally need tasks to specify what will be executed inside them rather than it spinning them up. So for me, no special container-related features is not a negative thing, but I can understand that for some it is, or it might be. The second and more important con or negative thing is the watcher. It works, but it does not work well. It should not execute the task, whichever task you're running, whenever source code changes, but whenever source code changes, unless a task is already running. Otherwise, we might end up with multiple tasks running in parallel or a new task stopping the old one or whichever random permutation might happen. As for pros, there are many, and in the interest of brevity, I will limit myself to only a few. To begin with, task file is easy to write and easy to read. Anyone, and I repeat, anyone can learn it in no time. Next, task probably provides all the features we might need. It has dependencies, it can run them in parallel, it can run in the watch mode when it works, and so on and so forth. What else? Oh yeah, documentation is excellent. Really, really good. I never had an issue finding an example or details for what I'm trying to accomplish. The documentation is not huge, it's not massive, it does not contain everything anyone might ever need, yet it is not too short either. It is not missing anything, yet it is not overwhelming either. It's just right. Finally, it's a mature project with large and active community that's been around for quite some time now. It's not too old, so it's based on the experience we have from older tools like Makefile, yet it was not born a few weeks ago. Its age is just, just right. That's it. There is only one, maybe two, negative things I can say about it. Assuming that we're looking for a declarative task or pipeline or steps or commands executor. If you want to write those things in Go or Python or some other real language, Dagger is still a better option. But if you're looking for a solution that allows us to use a declarative format, and if YAML is the one you prefer, task is a great choice. Great, amazing choice. Especially for those who are using Make, but they're not happy with it. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one. Cheers.